On this episode, the plane crash that killed the only son of John F. Kennedy was no pilot error, says my guest. There was a bomb on that plane, and the plot was to silence John Kennedy Jr. before he investigated too deeply into his father's assassination. He was talking to reporters that he was going to use the magazine to investigate his father's assassination. And we know very far back in the late 1970s, when he was in high school, he was telling his girlfriend then, Meg Azioni, that he was doubting the official version of events of the Kennedy assassination. And throughout the 1980s and the 1990s, he concluded that it was in fact the agency and George Bush that was behind the Kennedy assassination. The Horrible Movie Podcast is a weekly show hosted by Jack Altermatt. Jack invites a guest who brings a horrible theater-released movie to dissect. Jack and his guest take you through the highs and lows of the movie and what makes it horrible. New movies, older movies, cult classics, or box office busts. No movie is spared or safe from the Horrible Movie Podcast. It's a fun show with clean language, and it's available through Spreaker.com, Apple Podcasts, StudioDNA.media, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Remember, just because it's from Hollywood doesn't mean it isn't horrible. Welcome to your Friday. Now, a couple of weeks ago, when I took my boys up to the cottage in Bala for a little bass fishing, I said the bass were biting, and they were. Well, the fish are biting here too, but we're not fishing. The last couple of times to the beach here, just outside Kalamata, Zachary and uh, the mighty Aphrodite have actually been bitten by some kind of fish. Now, there are no sharks in the uh, Messinian Bay. Uh, you know, that's the, the second question I always ask when I travel somewhere, some foreign place on the ocean. The first question I ask is, can I turn right on a red light? But the second question is, are there sharks here? I read Peter Benchley's Jaws in 1976 on summer vacation when I was 12, and I have never been the same since. However, no sharks here, but, but some kind of little fish is biting members of my family around the ankles and knees. And nothing too serious, not enough to keep them out of the water. Uh, I unpacked the telescope last night, and uh, the boys and I spent an hour checking out the craters on the moon. It was spectacular. Okay, that's a, an update on my situation here in Greece. Let's get to it, shall we? My guest on this episode of Conspiracy Unlimited presents evidence of a conspiracy to assassinate the only surviving son of President John F. Kennedy and considers the motive that many powerful forces had to make sure he never set foot in the White House. He'll examine the potential motives the Bush family, the CIA, had, and he'll systematically dismantle the official version of events that JFK Jr crashed his plane due to pilot error. He'll examine both the evidence of a government cover-up at the crime scene and the extensive eyewitness reports of an explosion that brought the aircraft down. John Kerner is a professor of American history at Erie Community College in Williamsville, New York. He's the author of several books, The Secret Plot to Kill McKinley and Why the CIA Killed JFK and Malcolm X, The Secret Drug Trade in Laos. Kerner has a master's degree in American history from the State University of New York College at Brockport and a bachelor's degree in communication journalism from St. John Fisher College, where he graduated summa cum laude with honors. He's also the founder of Paranormal Walks, a ghost walk company that explores the paranormal history of Western New York through annual walking tours. His latest is called Exploding the Truth, the JFK Jr. Assassination. John Kerner, welcome to Conspiracy Unlimited. How are you? I'm doing great, Richard. Thanks for having me on the show. It's been really a pleasure to talk to you recently. I'm great to be back. Great having you. Next year will be the 20th anniversary of the death of John yeah. Kennedy Jr. And, uh, you know, there hasn't been a lot uh, written about, about his death. Uh, how did you uh, begin exploring this topic? Well... I think I've always been fascinated with the Kennedy family, and I did a book about JFK's assassination, the connection with the CIA, and when I wrote that book, I just felt that because the agency had targeted his father, and also his, you know, his brother Robert Kennedy, I felt it was logical that there might be at least worth raising some questions about 
his son's death. And the further I looked into it, sure enough, there are plenty of reasons to suspect that it was not an accident. Well, take us back to that day. Uh, he's he's uh, piloting a, a small aircraft uh, to Martha's Vineyard. What happened? Well, initially, the reports were not very clear what happened. It was obviously a very tragic day. I mean, JFK Jr. was an icon. This man was the president's only surviving son. He, of course, did everything you could possibly ask for a beautiful wife. He was publisher of a successful magazine in George. And then just suddenly he was cut down in his prime and the nation was just shocked. How could this possibly happen to him? And the, the initial investigation uh, by the FAA determined that it was spatial disorientation and pilot error. And I go into my book trying to explain that really both of those things were just not really possible. And according to the evidence that I looked at, it just doesn't make any sense. What does that mean, spatial disorientation? Well, it's kind of like if you're in a situation like maybe in a blizzard, if you're driving in a blizzard, where you, you can't see what's in front of you and you don't know where, what's left, what's right, what's up, what is down, and you make decisions based off of information that's not logical, so it could cause a crash. This happened to me when I was driving in a blizzard. I, I had no idea what was in front of me. I crashed my car because I couldn't see what was in front of me. So the FAA said in their investigation that that's what caused the plane to crash, that he was disoriented. But there are two factors, which I invested in my book, which I believe make that impossible. One is that, according to their own research by the FAA, the weather that night was completely fine, according to them. There was only some, some fog over Martha's Vineyard. And secondly, this is even more important, at 9.39 p.m., which is one minute before the crash, JFK Jr. radios, radios into Martha's Vineyard Airport. He says he's on approach and he wants to land. And then one minute later, the plane crashes or explodes. So if he was suffering from disorientation, he would have reported then and asked for help, which he did not do. So those two factors, the good weather and his lack of reporting any problems on the aircraft, lead me to conclude there was no disorientation, it was in fact an explosion on the aircraft. Now, let's talk about the weather, because you, I think you're right, the, the original reports, and you have to be, you know, you have to push record <laughs> to capture these, because once you hear them in the early stages, things change very quickly. The initial reports were that the weather was clear, and then it seems to me, if unless I'm misremembering, that narrative changed, and we started to hear about bad weather. Am I, am, I, am I remembering it correctly, that, that the, the narrative changed? They started to actually report later that it was bad weather? It did change, yeah. And, and it wasn't even accurate. Because those that were there on the ground were doing things like fishing. I mean, it wasn't a good night to fish. People were storming the beaches. There was nothing wrong with the weather that night. It was a beautiful night. And only later on did the official version change to make it seem like there was some sort of pilot error. Another part of the story, too, was this myth that was being pushed that JFK Jr. was a bad pilot. That he was somehow reckless or somehow meticulous with the aircraft. That's also or or, or that he wasn't rated for instrument flying. Right. None of that w uh, matches up with the evidence. In fact... He had flown that exact same flight five times without a flight instructor at night. So he knew how to do the flight. There, there was no problem there. He, he knew the flight. It was easy for him. He knew how he was autopilot. The whole idea that this was some kind of accident that he caused is simply not following the facts of the case. Just several weeks, maybe, or a month prior, he had flown in up to, uh, to Canada, up to uh, uh, Buttonville Airport, north of Toronto. Uh, and at that time, he, uh, he was hobbling around, he had a foot cast. 
did he did he have one at the time of the crash? Did because I'm 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 thinking I remember something about them maybe blaming the fact that he had this foot injury that maybe that hampered his ability to fly. Maybe I'm just misremembering that. No, no, too. that's an excellent point to address. Yeah, so he had flown with the cast before, first of all, and the day before. The crash, I should say, you know, the explosion, which we'll talk about a bit later, why it was an explosion. He took, the, the cast was removed the following Thursday morning, previous day in the morning. So he had the entire day of Thursday to test the foot. He went to a Yankees game. He worked out. He did a number of things. He walked around New York without, without the cast. He was able to use the foot easily enough. He stopped into a grocery store to pick up some vitamin water for the flight. The attendant there asked him how the foot was. He said it was it was better. So all the evidence points to the fact the foot was fine. Also, we can say there was an hour of flight that he was able to do, including takeoff, that was perfectly fine with the supposedly bad foot that was done without any incident, one hour of flight. So all those things add up for me to believe the, the myth that people were putting for that somehow he caused the accident because his foot was hurt. It's simply not true. Where was he heading that day? There was a wedding at the compound at Hyannis Port for Rory Kennedy, uh, Bobby Kennedy's daughter, his youngest daughter. And he was dropping off his sister-in-law at Martha's Vineyard, and then he's going to head up there for the wedding. So they're about to land at the Vineyard Airport, and they're about two minutes out before the explosion took place. And then they're going to head up to the wedding for Rory Kennedy. So, he, yes, again, his wife, uh, Carolyn Bissett, was in the plane and his sister-in-law, you mentioned, Lauren Bissett. She was being dropped off at Martha's Vineyard before they headed on up to Hyannisport for this wedding. What right, was, she's going to join them later. Yeah. Now, what leads you to believe before we talk about you know motive or who may have been behind it, why do you think mm-hmm. it was an explosion? Were there eyewitness, uh, is there eyewitness testimony to corroborate an explosion? There's two different factors we can point to for an explosion. One is that it seems obvious the cabin was breached. It wasn't a normal crash, where the normal crash would be a small plane crushes together on impact, everything is together, bodies, luggage, everything in one spot. If it's just a crash based on disorientation, everything's in one area. If there was an explosion, that means the the cabin would be breached, there would be debris everywhere around the area. And that was the case with this. Large area, there were a number of things recovered, not near crash site, including luggage, a sneaker, and a wheel from the plane. So that indicate to investigators like Jim Mars, who of course wrote a number of books about the Kennedy assassination, that he felt the cabin had been breached. And there's of course investigations for other plane crashes. He felt that that evidence there of debris being over a large field was evidence of an explosion. The second thing is, as you mentioned, there were three witnesses on the ground that did see what they felt was an explosion in the sky. And one of them was a lawyer from Pennsylvania. Another one was a reporter from the Vineyard Gazette. And a third one was a member of the Kennedy family that was headed to the, to the wedding that weekend. And all of them saw in the sky this explosion. And I intended to contact uh, all three of them with with some success. And that is, I talk about how they went through that in the book, how I was able to reach out to them and look for more information about all three of them. And hence the title of the book, Exploding the Truth, the JFK Jr. Assassination. Let's talk about what what John Kennedy was up to. You, you mentioned, of course, publishing mm-hmm. uh, George Magazine. Right. Um, and people believed that he had political aspirations, that he was going to be running for the, I believe there was a vacancy in the uh, the, the Senate for, for New York. Uh, right. That was also a Senate seat that uh, the former First Lady, Hillary Clinton, had her eyes on. 
what do you think? Was was he going to run? Is there evidence he was going to run for for the Senate? What had happened there was he discussed with his family that he was not interested in running for the Senate. Uh, he felt that he did not want to go up against the Clinton family, that they were too close to each other, and their connections were too close. It would just be like running against a, a family friend. So he he ruled out that run for the Senate, and he made it clear he would not do that. And in fact, one of his friends put it, I think, very nicely. He was too much of a gentleman to do that. He just was too much of a gentleman. He just was a, a good man and too honorable to do that kind of thing. He was much more interested in running for governor of New York. That was what he had his sights on. And the next time that was up for election was 2002. So he was positioning himself for that. That was what was on his mind. And that would be a stepping stone to the White House. That was what his plans were. So that was the, the long-term goal. When we get to 1999, he was looking to position himself for a run for governor, for president probably in 2004. So he would only serve two years uh, of, of his um, mandate. That's rather unusual, isn't it? Well, not too unusual. There are a number of cases where a small term in, in governor of New York under the presidency. FDR was only governor for about a year. Uh, Grover Cleveland was, was governor of New York for just about a year. Uh, T.R. was governor of New York for about six months and he became vice president and then became president and president McKinley. So it, it sometimes happens where there's a small or short time as governor, especially of New York, that can be a, a stepping stone to the presidency. And I think based on his name recognition, he would have been, that alone would have been able to launch him to the presidency. I mean, look at him with the way people thought about him. He was almost apolitical. He was able to rise above politics out of his entire life, where he would position himself as being a man of grace and calm, could appeal to really both parties. So I think just based on his personality, his, his name recognition, and a very strong uh, mandate in a way for him becoming president. And, I mean, did he talk about how he was going to use the presidency, perhaps, to further investigate his his father's assassination? And, and I guess part B of that question is, did he use George Magazine uh, to investigate his, his father and his uncle's assassinations? You know from two different sources that he was talking to reporters about that very idea that he was going to use the magazine to investigate his father's assassination. He had positioned himself to, to do that in 1999 into the year 2000. That was the next goal of the magazine. And we know very far back in the late 1970s, when he was in high school, he was telling his girlfriend then, uh, Meg Azioni, that he was doubting the official version of events of the Kennedy assassination. So even far back into his teenage years, he was questioning what had happened back in Dallas and began his own investigation. And throughout the 1980s into the 1990s, he concluded that it was, in fact, the agency and George Bush that was behind the Kennedy assassination. So I think one major motive to eliminate him was to stop that from happening and also so he would not be a rival to George H.W. Bush's son, George Bush, in the presidency. So all that kind of mixes into the motives part of the book. Interesting. He, he believed that George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, who, again, mysteriously couldn't remember where he was on November the 22nd of 1963. <laughs> right. uh, it, it, now, I, I've, I've heard that that's why he, he called it George Magazine. Most people think, well, it was because it was George Washington, uh, but maybe secretly he was sending a signal to George Poppy Bush, I know you did it. What do you think of that? I think that is exa exactly why he named the magazine that. He never said it was for George Washington. And pointedly never said that at any time the magazine was published. So we, we can just trace the evidence back to Dallas 
1963, there is a, a lot of evidence that clean photographs that Poppy Bush was in Dealey Plaza and was recruited into the agency as far back as 1948 when he was in Yale. Many people in the Skull and Bone Society were recruited, were out of the agency, into the agency, I should say, including him. And he was part of the, the team that organized the Bay of Pigs invasion. In fact, the two of the ships were named, one was named Barbara, which of course is his, his wife's, his late wife's name for the Bay of Pigs invasion. So there is a lot of anger that comes from the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion that leads directly to motives to kill JFK from the Bush family, which of course is a different story entirely. But his son, of course, knew about this. He questioned all these things and was willing to look into the matter just before he mysteriously dies in July of 1999. History professor, author John Kerner is here discussing the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr. I want to talk about the search for the body. Uh, uh, yes. Talk to me about that because there are some unusual things going on. First of all, it seemed even after they found the wreckage, it seemed it, to take quite a while for them to actually bring the bodies to the surface. Is that correct? Am I remembering that correctly? You're absolutely right. And this gives us a chance to kind of get into the weeds a little bit here about some things, but it's worth discussing this in a bit of detail, what happened there that morning. The Piper Saratoga was a state-of-the-art aircraft. It was equipped with an emergency locator beacon that was meant to, of course, give it signal upon impact. And then the afternoon of July 17th, the day after the explosion, Peter Jennings reports on the air that the Navy located the rescue beacon and was closing in on it at 2.15 a.m. So the, the crash takes place at 9.41 p.m., and not until 2.15 a.m. did they find the locator beacon. Now the problem is it gets very strange from there because the Navy then says something totally amazing. They say, well, hang on a second. It's not the Piper of Saratoga. It, it is a downed Navy military aircraft rescue beacon. And they, just let us think about that for a second. The Navy is saying, hang on a second. We did not find the Piper of Saratogas. We found a rescue beacon from a downed military aircraft in the same spot of this accident from JFK Jr.'s plane. Right. I mean, how could there be an unaccounted for uh, naval plane? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 you're right. Absolutely. That makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. Another thing is the mainstream media doesn't question this. They just say, oh, okay, it's not the Saratoga, so we'll just leave the story at that. But they should not have. They should not have stopped it. They should have said, "Well, if it's a down aircraft, first of all, who died in the in the in the, in the crash? Did it did it collide with the JFK Jr.'s plane? Is there a wreckage to recover? I mean, all these things are worth asking. So, obviously, it's probably not down aircraft because if there are dead pilots, there'd be families notified of that. They'd be. Be, someone would talk about that. Right. There'd be some right. deaths that would accompany that. Well, and if so it was it a navy, if it, if it was a downed naval aircraft, obviously they would have. <laughs> that would have been in the news. It would have been one reported missing. Yeah, absolutely. All right, but and as you then, say, the, not only that, we have a you know a, a mainstream media with with uh, lacking an, even an, an ounce of intellectual curiosity. So that just they they, they 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 bite it the hook, line, and sinker. They really did. And another thing to think about, too, is that there are two very different sounds. Piper Saratoga's rescue beacon is very high-pitched and shrill, almost annoying in its sound. It just, it's, it's like a, a very high-pitched sound. The other alleged sound from down aircraft from the military is like a foghorn. So the high pitch, it's, it's like a constant shrill sound. But the other sound is like a repeating foghorn. Uh, 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 for military sounds. The other one is just, mm, it's way different. So to fuse the two makes completely no sense. So we have to conclude a couple things here. We, we Either there's a downed aircraft that they covered up 
Or they did find the Pepper of Saratoga, which is much more logical. They actually did find the aircraft at 2.15 a.m. and used the extra time there to lie to the public to cover up the crime scene, to, to not give any evidence of, of an explosion or a bomb. That's why they did that, to seal off the area, give themselves more time to recover the bodies, and clean up the evidence for an explosion. So the bodies, if it was an explosion, obviously the bodies would have been uh, in, in terrible shape. I mean, they would have been perhaps scorched, perhaps dismembered. Absolutely. They would show signs of an explosion. If it's just pilot error, if you just play out their scenario where the, the plane just goes, spirals down right into the water, the bodies would be fine. It would just be, you know, a bit waterlogged. And, and, and identifiable, but they wouldn't be mutilated and, and, and scattered in their body parts everywhere. That would be much different. It would indicate, obviously, I mean, that they been a, the victim of, of an explosion. So it was it was a situation there that needed to, to delicacy to handle. So they seal up the area, uh, 17 nautical miles, no fly zone, no entry for the media. Only people that could serve the area was the good old CIA. They were allowed in there and no one else, plus the Navy, of course, too. So once they 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 get the bodies recovered, they're they're buried in in, in very short order, correct? Absolutely, they're taken away. No autopsy was allowed, and it, it was it was covered up very quickly. Investigation was done haphazardly, and the FAA concluded, as I mentioned, it was pilot error. But as we mentioned before, it doesn't make any sense because the conditions didn't indicate that. And JFK's flight record, JFK Jr.'s flight record, indicated he was a pilot that was meticulous, careful. He was an autopilot and was anything other than a, a reckless pilot. Well, what about the Kennedy family? Did, were they allowed to see the body? And, and if so, obviously they would have realized that this was not an ordinary... Mm -hmm. Uh, airplane crash, they would have been screaming bloody murder. What happened? Yeah, Ted Kennedy was very upset. He was spending many hours on the phone with the FAA trying to figure out what was going on, and he was being stonewalled well into July 17th, the information about what happened to his nephew. And the Kennedy family was holed up at Hyannisport looking for information, and even they weren't allowed to know what was going on so it was the only real thing we could really find out of any use to us as investigators was the idea that Peter Jennings reported on the air on July 17th that at 2.15 a.m. they had found that rescue beacon. The Navy then disclaimed it as being one of their own. And that's the one thing we could take out from the coverage, and that's about it. So the Kennedys never saw the bodies? Only later on were the bodies taken uh, to Hannah's port, but we're never told who got to see them, if they were switched perhaps. We have no idea. There was no chain of evidence from the crime scene to the burial. Nothing. We don't know if Jake with JFK's body, if it was if it was changed, if, it, if some other person was substituted for it. We have no idea what took place with the bodies. Is uh, in in the case of an FAA investigation after a crash of an, an aircraft, isn't auto, isn't an autopsy mandatory? It is mandatory. The problem, though, is for some very strange reason, the crime scene was being investigated by the Navy and and the CIA. They are the ones that were covering the bodies, so we have no idea for well over an entire day what they were doing in that no-fly zone and no-entry zone. So as far as we know, they could have substituted anybody they wanted for the actual bodies. We have no idea what they did. There's no chain of evidence. All right, so uh, let's get back to motive. We've talked about the Bush family and uh -huh. uh, their connection right. to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, and obviously, they were concerned, if this, this was true, that, that uh, should John Jr. become president, uh, or even if he didn't, he, he, was, he, he had made it clear he was going to start using his publication, George Magazine, to start investigating his father's uh, death. Uh, who else may be uh, culpable? Who else may have had a motive? 
I think it's worth taking a, a little bit of time trying to exonerate the, the Clinton family. Uh, there has been some speculation they may have wanted to, to, to see him dead. I think it's just, it's just absurd to think that. Uh, for one reason, the main motive that people could say is he was going to run against her for the Senate. And as I mentioned before, that was not going to be the case. He never was going to do that. He told his friends he was interested in the Senate. He would not want to run against her. He was too much of a gentleman to, to do that kind of a thing, too honorable. He was instead going to run for governor, and that was what he was going to set his sights on. Also, this is a key thing, too. During the Clinton sex scandals of the 1990s, George uh, Magazine never published a word about those those scandalous sex scandals. He was a big supporter of the Kennedy family all throughout his time in office. In fact, he sent this kind of funny fax to President Clinton that said, um, he said, I was a kid in the White House. I could fit under the desk. I know an intern could never fit under there. So, you know, Best wishes, John. So he, he was very supportive of President Clinton. Uh, in fact, a number of times during the Clinton run for the presidency, one big supporter was Jackie Kennedy. She came out early in favor of Bill Clinton. Clinton appointed uh, one of JFK's uh, sisters to be an ambassador to Ireland. So there's a lot of things with, within the two families that made them very close. And one thing was, again, his support for Clinton and his presidency and the support that existed between Jackie and, and Bill Clinton and his run for president. So there really is no motive there at all. All right. So who else may have been involved? Well, there is another possibility uh, that the Israelis may have wanted to kill JFK Jr. too. So... He published an article in George Magazine that talked about the assassination of Itzhak Rabin. Now, this one happened, this article happened in March 1997. And in the article, he suggests that the Israeli government, in fact, their intelligence agencies, conspired to kill Itzhak Rabin, much like our government did to kill President Kennedy. So there was a lot of speculation that perhaps there might have been an interest in killing JFK Jr. because of this article. The problem with this is that if this was the case, why wait two and a half years to kill JFK Jr.? Because this article, again, takes place in March of 97, and the plane crash takes place in, of course, July of 1999. That seems very strange, the long stretch of time there that, in fact, was then behind this. There's also no evidence of them involved in the assassination of JFK Jr. There's just, there's, just, there's nothing there to, to follow the line back to them. But I guess it's possible. It is possible they may work with the agency to kill JFK Jr. There's a motive there. We can certainly say there might have been a motive at the very... Although once the article's out, what's the point? I mean... The, the article was yeah. written, the points were made. Uh, I mean, there were other, I, I've read entire books about how certain elements of Mossad may have been involved in taking out Yitzhak Rabin because, uh, you know, his, his land for peace uh, and so forth. So, yeah, it, that does sound tenuous. So is then the more likely culprit here, George Herbert Walker Bush? I think it makes a lot of sense. I think the motive is there because of the two factors I mentioned, that J.K. Jr. was a rival to the younger Bush, political rival, that would be eliminated. And secondly, the idea that the evidence of the assassination would be uncovered in his magazine. So without, with, with him no longer being alive, those two things are taken care of pretty quickly. Also, I looked at it in the book that it is not unusual for the Kennedy family to be a target of the CIA. It just is kind of what they do. Uh, they killed both RFK and JFK. And I looked at the evidence in the book for that. It's pretty clear that they were behind both of those assassinations. 
we talked about, of course, your hand, your hand, admitting that just a couple years ago. We ta- we've talked about the connections the agency had with JFK and Jim Mars, of course, talked about this too. It's pretty clear they were behind that as well, at least just, in a support role. Just a quick least. sidebar, John, uh, uh, Robert Kennedy mm-hmm. Jr. recently met Sirhan Sirhan in prison near San Diego, uh, sat down with him. I, I think they, they met for at least two hours. And, and Bobby Kennedy Jr. is now convinced that Sirhan Sirhan was not responsible for his father's uh, murder or was at the very least some sort of a, you know, he was used as some sort of a mind control patsy. That is an amazing development. Yeah, it is. It found, the truth finally come out all these years later. So even uh, look in the book that in the summer of 1964, it is possible that Edward Kennedy was also the target of a hit by the agency when his plane crashed too, on a flight to, of all places, <laughs> Hyannis Sport. So he really survived that one, too. Chubbaquiddick also was suspicious. So all three Kennedy brothers were targets of the agency at one point or another. And I think it just makes a lot of sense, even if for the very idea of just, of just revenge, more targeting of the, of, the, of the family. It just makes sense. Because of the Bay and of Pigs itself, fiasco. Because of the Bay of Pigs fiasco, right, right. Absolutely. So even the date itself, I think, is suspicious. July 17th. 1999, which is July 16th, 1999, the day the plane goes down. If you go back in time, that day is a day that is a bit notorious in the JFK administration. In 1962, he began an affair with the wife of Cord Meyer in the agency, Mary. So he, he began an affair that night that may have been a long time coming to get revenge for. So JFK's um, infidelity may have been the reason why they picked that day to take down his son. Interesting, possibly. interesting. Yes, John Kennedy and Mary Pinchot Meyer. Uh, I mean, we all know that John Kennedy was uh, a ladies' man, and uh, but but this this was no ordinary affair. I mean, there was a real seemed like a real deep spiritual bond uh, there between those yeah, two. There really was. There really was. And point they had been divorced. It was his ex-wife. But the affair may have gone back to the fifties because they were neighbors in Washington, I think in Georgetown. And he may have began the affair back in the fifties with Mary because they were next door neighbors. It's possible. Just that's right. I read. I had read that. Did. Yes. Yes. That's true. So. He may have been holding a grudge against JFK for a long time. And Cord Meyer was still alive when JFK Jr.'s plane went down. He died the following year. So it's, again, I find it at least interesting that the day of JFK Jr.'s assassination, July 16th, is the same day that JFK, uh, JFK's father, John F. Kennedy, began this affair on July 16th, 1962. So it just seems unusual that there was that connection. Has anyone else drawn that connection, John, besides you? No, this is the first uh, I've heard of it. In fact, I go into the book as well that that day, July 16th, has a number of other unusual things that take place throughout U.S. history, including um, George Bush picking his vice president, uh, Dick Cheney, on that day, on July 16th when he was running for president so it's just it's it's very strange that that day has a number of things that that seem to be unusual with the Bush family and with the Kennedy family exploding the truth the JFK Jr. assassination well you have done an incredible job here John Uh, this I think is going to um, go down as the definitive book uh, on this topic how do uh, how do folks get a, a hold of a copy it's very simple. Amazon has it. Uh, right now it's on pre-order. Uh, it comes out October 28th of this year. So it, it is pre-ordered right now, but you'll get it on time if you order it early. So that's one benefit, I guess. <laughs> Exploding the Truth, the JFK Jr. Assassination by John Kerner, K-O-E-R-N-E-R. And uh, give us a website if people want to get in touch. Uh, my website is paranormalwalks.com. 
dot com and do some ghost walks in Western New York. I also have some links to my book. So again, paranormalwalks.com. dot com. Paranormal dot com. John, a great pleasure. Thank you so much for this. Richard, thank you so much. It was my pleasure too. Great research, great book, great guest. Now, before I say goodnight to the moon over Messenia, I'm going to tell you what's coming up next on Conspiracy Unlimited. <laughs> 